Welcome back to the Unanimous Decision Podcast. I'm your host, D-Palm. Follow me on Twitter at D-Palm66. You can follow the show on Twitter at UDPod. When you're talking about the show on Twitter or any social media, make sure you use the hashtag UDPod so I can find you. And thank you for the shout out. We are, of course, brought to you by the good folks over at the MTR Network. It brings you everything. We've got your news of the day. We've got politics. We've got movie reviews, comic book reviews, television reviews. I know that Legends of Tomorrow just wrapped up. We just got back in the full swing of things with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Make sure you're also subscribed to our premium service. It's $8 a month, but it's up to 10 new episodes of content that you don't hear anywhere else. We don't promo anywhere on the on the network. It's the best way to hear the most out of the MTR network. It's only $8 a month. It's a great addition to your day. If you have more you want to say to me or to the show, you can email us at udpodcast at gmail.com. You can also leave a five-star review in the iTunes store. If you leave a five-star review, we'll read anything that you write on the air on the air. I mean, I have to read it. It's one of the policies. I've had to make fun of myself twice on this at least. Take advantage. You know, if you want to insult me, I guess you can. That's kind of hurtful and mean. But hey, it's your freedom. It's your five stars. Use them as you will. Subscribe in the iTunes store. Subscribe anywhere else you can get your podcasts for absolutely free. And I know what you're wondering. Deep Palm, you promised no more Road to WrestleMania podcasts. However, I also promised you a Podomania podcast to lead into it. And I'm going to be honest. Last week, we did record about an hour and a half of the greatest podcast ever recorded. I don't mean to sound like um, the guy who's currently inhabiting, I think, Mar-a-Lago right now. I'm not entirely sure where he is. But I'm not going to be quoting him directly, but his hyperbole would fit here. We recorded the greatest three-man pod. I worked with my trios team of Sam Franco. You've heard of him lots of times. I was actually on his radio show last week, Talking WrestleMania on Friday morning. The link will be in the show notes if you missed my appearance. We also had on Cameron, a.k.a. follow him on Twitter, at Seahawk, C-E-E, Hawk. He is another part of the East Coast cast for PW Torch, where my normal tag partner comes through, Rich Fan, um, R. Deuce on Twitter. He works tags with me. Cam works the trios. We get everything done. Our trio match was beautiful last week. It was a beautiful podcast, but no one will ever hear it because technology is weird and the internet ate our recording. When I tell you that I went five for five at NXT, I need you to believe me. I may have to tag in Sam or Cameron to, to back me up, but I picked that NXT card. If you want to hand me the pin trips, I'm ready. But yes, I know I promised no more wrestling. This is a recap show since you didn't get Podomania 1. You're going to get the Podomania recap, Podomania Fallout. I know that I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited. Nate, how you feeling? Well, all right, let's get right to it. Let's start like we always do outside the ring. Um, it's popular. It's easy, it's fun, it's kind of like the cool kids in school to say lots of bad things about the WWE. And are there arguments against the monopolization of professional wrestling? Of course there are. There are lots of reasons why a lot of us maybe should or could be against it. That said, all the indies in the world descended on Orlando last weekend. People from England, Japan, and all corners of the globe came over and worked last weekend. And they all left with a lot more money than they came with and probably a few new fans. Because there are fans who now, the WrestleMania experience is no longer going down for a day, catching the show and getting out. Oh, no, no, no. There's Hall of Fame. There's NXT. There's Access happening all the time. So it becomes such an event that naturally fans are going to want to see what else is out there, see what else is being offered that week in Orlando. There was something for everyone in pro wrestling this past weekend. I'm happy to say that all the indie guys came in. I'm sure not everyone made money because that's not how money works, but I know a lot of guys did. I know that there are a lot of people who maybe work one region or one country who gained new fans over the weekend. So when people say, oh, WWE you know, such a, a monopoly, they're, they're steamrolling a little guy, if they wanted to end the indies, they could do it in about a week. It'd be over. Indie wrestling would be over. But they're not stupid. They appreciate what the indies have meant to this business, to this company, particularly when you talk about some of the guys who picked up W's on Sunday night. We'll get to them shortly. So, like, even guy, I know Mike Elgin's a big name on the indies. Hopefully he makes his way to the E one day. But I'll tell you right now, I heard him. Ta- I heard Meltzer talking about him. He worked 10 matches. 
over the weekend. That's money in his pocket. That's fans who are following his brand now. That's growing the business. That's what this should be about. Uh, it was a crazy weekend in the Indies. We're not going to spend too much time with him because it is the WWE's weekend. But I think an interesting thing that happened was the Hardys, whom we, you may have heard will be appearing later in the podcast, spoiler warning, they lost their tag team titles for Ring of Honor in a ladder match to the Young Bucks. Now, people say, oh, you know, that's kind of their forte. When you see some of the videos and gifts that are going to come out from that Ring of Honor show, the bumps they took, the risks they took, and it was the reason why I had kind of talked myself out of not seeing them for a while. I was like, oh, they're going to work like that, then there's no way, no how, that the WWE is right around the corner. But, once again, worked myself into a shoot. Uh, other outside the ring news, Hall of Fame is amazing. I'm not a Hall of Fame guy. I don't like watching the speeches a lot. I watched Sting a couple years ago because, obviously, Sting Mark. I watched part of this year because, and I've been on record here and other places, I'm a huge fan, historically, of Kurt Angle, Comedy Kurt. Comedy Kurt, for me, was almost a, a misuse of the perfect wrestling machine. And this is a guy who's, Korean WWE, people forget, was only about four to five years. It was a bright run, it was a big run, but it was a quick run. And every second that they used him in, you know, singing Sexy Kurt or drinking milk, I thought he could be better in the ring. Kurt Angle went out there at the Hall of Fame and put him and got over by being a joke. He sang all the songs, he wore the little hat. He took the milk bath at the end, and I love there's a shot of, uh, in the crowd of AAA, of, excuse me, HBK and Kevin Nash, and HBK is cracking up, because he gets it, he, he's, he's 100% in, and Kevin Nash looks so confused, he's like, he's not belittling anyone, and he's not making anyone else look terrible, but they're applauding. If you're a Kevin Nash fan or if you followed his career, you'll think that's very funny. If not, you'll wonder why I'm bagging on a guy whose quads just won't stay attached to his leg. Um, welcome home, JR. Uh, Jim Ross came back to call the main event on Sunday. And uh, after the week that we all know he had, we covered it here, uh, losing his, as he called her, his little angel. Um, it's good that he's able to come home. Uh, I listened to his podcast this week, and he said how good it was to have to be around people who knew him and who, who knew Jan and who could communicate effectively and honestly how much they each had meant. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it's good. It just feels right, man. It feels right with JR back under the WWE umbrella. I know he's been calling me in New Japan shows for Access TV. It's my understanding that uh, that, that avenue will still continue. So now you've got a WWF employee, WWE employee, excuse me. Wow, that was old. Uh, working with New Japan in a partnership capacity, working with their American partners, but working with them nonetheless. And that just, the first note in 2017 is going to be a really, really weird pro wrestling year. <laughs> it's going to be super strange. Um, and uh, before we get into, like I said, the shows of the weekend, I do want to talk about some things that have come up. Justin Roberts, you guys may remember him as a WWE announcer. His book is finally out. It's available on Amazon, everywhere you can buy books. I don't do people buy books still? Or do you guys like, I don't know, is there like a cheat for books? Hmm. Anyway, um, I, I haven't read it yet. I'm, I'm going to buy it, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. And what, what are the, some of the excerpts have brought to light is some of the backstage culture in the WWE. And while we've all would like to think that the thing that we love has grown up from its carny roots, it's still got carny roots. So he cites a lot of the bullying, the, the hazing behavior backstage. I um, mean, he... I'm not speaking outside of school here when I say that John Bradshaw Layfield is a continual presence in those stories. And normally, I, I'm not big on reading people's books. I'm not really big on hearing revisionist history about the past and w w paying to have someone work me over for 400 pages. But I'm going to buy this one because it ties into something that's happening right now. And it's for anyone who's a regular listener of, or viewer, excuse me, of SmackDown Live, you may have noticed that lead announcer Mauro Ranallo has not been present. He missed the opportunity to be one of, I think it's less than 10 men to call lead at WrestleMania this year 
because apparently off of um, off screen and on screen bullying from JBL had caused a remittance of and a resurgence of J- uh, Maro's well documented depression. He's diagnosed bipolar and he's spoken very openly and outwardly about it about the need for everyone to take care of themselves and each other. And it's, I think he's just been a a great force for that. But apparently that caused uh, an episode, and uh, that's why Maro's been on television and. Meltzer, I guess, in light of the Justin Roberts book coming out, he expanded on some of the uh, JBL bullying with Mauro and said that he had been far too lenient um, in his original reporting. Because uh, I don't think we covered it here, but the reporting was basically that it was just, you know, it's just Mauro as a disease and this is what happens sometimes. But JBL's on air and off air badgering of Mauro, uh, apparently he took it very personally. And Mauro got uh, W, uh, got Russ Observer announced of the year. And uh, it's 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 something we all thought and hoped and dreamed. This company had grown past it. This business had grown past it. You look at a lot of things. You look at some of the interviews that Steph and uh, and Paul. I'm calling Paul when he's in his corporate role. Did this week, this past week, because it's it's the Super Bowl of wrestling, not just WWE. It's, it's wrestling. It's a celebration. And one of the big aspects is the BSR campaign. And I can vouch that they do great work through it. I do question the internal commitment because if you're going to have these campaigns run and and be such a big part of what the WWE is, how do we reconcile that with an apparent tacit agreement from upstairs that JBL can essentially be an asshole and do what he wants? And I'm covering it on my little corner of the internet because it can't be quiet. If it's quiet, they don't have to react. But when everyone's favorite announcer, when the man who won an outro of the year for wrestling is driven away by the antics of one of his coworkers and corporate does nothing, it speaks volumes. And I just wanted to bring it up here because I think Justin Robert books should be read because announcers go through a lot more than we think they do. And I also think that, uh, Mauro now not being on my television is a bad thing. And I think that it should be explored and discussed. And, um, that's just kind of where I stand on it. All right, let's get into the weekend because WWE had about 1 million hours of programming and I am determined not to have this take longer than an hour for me. So, let's start NXT show. Wonderful takeover. I was questioning a lot of the build for this. I was wrong because they came out and they put on a show. Ruby Riot is gold. Like, I want to see her and, uh, and, oh, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, the woman in Sanity's name? Oh, that's going to look the hell out of me. <laughs> I want to see, I want to see her and Nikki Cross link up. I want to see that become an extended feud. I love the little interactions we got in the six man or four man or eight man. I, see, it, when you got three and then the one, it's a mixed tag. But it's I don't know. It's an eight person tag that kicked off ta- uh, Takeover Orlando. Sanity looked great. I think that they're building big things as evidenced by one of their members being in the Andre the Giant the next night. Ty did the honors by taking the pin, and uh, that's what it had to be. I think Roddy Strong is finally catching on with this NXT crowd. They're figuring out what Roddy is. I think creative is too, but I do think he needs new music, the piano stuff, aside from, I think, arriving later for someone else, so we'll talk about later. I think that it just doesn't fit Roddy Strong, the Messiah of the Backbreaker. Next up was the debut of Alistair Black, and he took on Cian Almas. Cian Almas is one of the crisper workers in the ring, and I don't know if it was just me in my own head going to back to the Tommy Inn that I know and love and watch just do- deliver brutal strikes, but I was expecting a little bit more out of this match. It did the job. It got... Uh, Alistair Black over. It's going to be very strange for me to call, not call him Tommy in, but I'm going to work on it. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I think they've got really a lot of money there. That entrance was the best entrance of the weekend. Uh, and yeah, I think that they've found a way to toe the line that Richard mentioned on the podcast that do we go full Tommy in with like a satanic uh, Danish man? But they're, I think they're going to they're gonna flirt with it a little bit. Others are paying DIY into revival. I don't tell you. I guess it's just add water with DIY and Revival and you're going to get a five-star match or damn near close to it. Uh, Meltzer's ratings are out. He gave it a four and a half because Meltzer's a hater. Just kidding. Uh, but no, uh, the Officer Payne have really been helped by this three-way feud. I think that they've gotten a lot crisper in the ring. I love the four-man power bomb spot to the table. I thought that the booking was a little off on that. I think it would have gotten a higher grade if you'd eliminated the Revival first, if only because... 
once you've taken out DIY, it's hard to get the crowd invested for the back half of the match being heel heel. It's hard to, to, to look like a face in peril when you're not a face. So I think the booking was a little uh, mysterious there. But I love the finish. You had to have Austin of Pain go on their run here. Um, I love the new belts. Uh, I meant to mention that at the top of the show. They got new NXT belts. I'll talk about it as we get to them, but the tag belts look great. Uh, I think they look better than the main roster belts. I wouldn't want to be called up if I were a certain tag team holding those, holding that gold. But, uh, yeah, they've done a great job. Paul Ellering is a needed mouthpiece for these two young men, and uh, they've got bright futures ahead of them. Oscar took on Ember Moon next, and... One, I love that the women's belt looks just like the men's belt. That's awesome. I love the old NXT women's belt. I didn't love the pink rhinestones. I didn't love some of the aspects, the quote-unquote femme aspects they added to it, but I do love the revision that they've made to, 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 to really put it on equal footing to say that neither one is better or worse. Neither one is sequestered and different. They're just the NXT champion. And uh, that was a hell of a match. That was, and for all the, again, lack of story build, the thing I, I'm kind of here for, Cutting these two women loose and saying, go kick each other's ass for 20 minutes. That's a pretty good way to book a match. And I loved Oscar going full heel at the end with the ref bump and the ref uh, manipulation. And I think that that's a really good way to revitalize this character that's run rough shot over at XC. Because if you can get her to go full heel and get the fans to really turn on her, that pop when Ember Moon finally takes that belt off her is going to be delightful. And the last match of the card, I've seen people be down on Rick, um, Bobby Roode versus Nakamura, and I don't get it. I know I was raised in a very much Southern raised. I grew up watching Southern wrestling. So the character stuff that people love on the WWE side, I don't really, doesn't hit me as hard. But the realism, the realistic nature, the, the bringing the, the physicality, the working a hold, working a, a joint, working a limb, telling that story. That's what resonates with me. Bobby Roode worked old to school, and God bless him, Nakamura, for everyone who loved his match last year for all the high spots with, with Sammy and the excitement of seeing him in a ring. This was, like, of all the things we've seen from Nakamura in the last calendar year, this was the closest I've seen to Tokyo Dome Nakamura. To telling, excuse me, to telling that complete story, to finding out you know, kind of pushing himself and doing the consistent selling that people say they wanted to see more out of him. Well, there it is. You wanted to see it from Shinsuke. He delivered. And uh, we'll talk about him uh, later on. Let's get to Mania. Sunday and rolls around, and you realize that you're standing on the barrel of seven hours of wrestling. I don't know how you guys absorbed the pre-show, if you did at all, but it was okay. It was fine. I think Neville Aries was the great decision to get the crowd on their feet early. I thought the Andre the Giant Battle Royal was 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 great. Was well booked. I mean, got Mojo over, I guess, and to the effect that this has gotten anyone over besides Baron Corbin a little bit. Mojo, I think, is an interesting test case because I feel like in the back they were like, "Well, Mojo's friends with Gronk, but how long do we really expect him to be here? <laughs> like, do we save the Gronk thing for his first title win, or do we just have him win the Andre because Gronk's in the news and hey, it'll be great." And I think that while it was cool to see, it was a great moment, and the security guard trying to stop Gronkowski, which, by the way, no security guard has ever stopped Gronkowski, and he was so confused because he's like, no, 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 I'm actually supposed... He was in the right for once talking to security, and he was so confused, he's like, no, no, ma'am, I'm supposed to get in that ring and run over <laughs> that gentleman, <laughs> his name, I don't quite know. Like, you know, Gronk thought it was all a shoot, he's like, just go in there, you'll figure out what to do, like... I it was great, and uh, the security guard failing to stop him was the icing on the cake. Didn't understand the Dean Ambrose Baron Corbin booking until Tuesday. That's fine. If you're going to do a longer build with Baron and have him win the title on a place where he can really have a spotlight in doing so, that's fine. But I like the fact that Dean's down period at SmackDown has been holding the IC title and putting over a young talent because... Let's be honest, he was the number one draft pick. He was the champ when they came over. He should have, maybe could have gotten a longer run with the title, but hey, he runs best on top, but running down below, he's doing pretty good too. Let's start the show because of all the things I said about this match. And by the way, if you heard me tout my 5 0 NXT uh, picking record, there's a reason I'm not touting any record about uh, what happened on Sunday. I was wrong a lot. But I was right about this. AJ is the best wrestler on the planet. He was able to drag a very high-level match out of a man who 
Stuntman, sure. Why not? Maybe. Professional wrestler, I don't think so. And he dragged a four-star match out of him based on Meltzer's ratings. Look, I, I think that that's it, man. That's AJ's a made guy. AJ is good with Vince. This has proven everything they ever wanted to see out of AJ Styles. I'm like a lot of you. I'm curious to why it took him so long to get here. But man, oh man, now that he's here, they're making the most of the minutes. Next on the card was Owens and Jericho. And just a Bravo mo, uh, match out of both those guys. Not the highest work rate match that I was expecting, but the storytelling was really well done. The, the drama was really well earned. And Kevin Owens referencing the creation of Kevin by putting that one finger on the rope is another example of Kevin Owens being a perfect human being. I It's just troll and troll. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, Jericho's going to go down. Looks like we're getting a rematch at Payback. But yeah, that was the that was properly booked. And uh, yeah, it was really well done. The next up was the Raw Women's match. People were saying it underwhelmed. Maybe it did. Your mileage may vary. It didn't underwhelm for me as much because I thought I liked the story they were telling, at least at the beginning. But up against last year's triple threat match, hell, they it, maybe it did underwhelm. Maybe it did underachieve. But I loved the she yield moment when uh, Sasha, Bailey, and Charlotte all took the apron, staring down Nia Jax, and then you get the triple power bomb out of it. And I just, it felt good to see. It was, it was. I think those young ladies had a lot of fun in there, and uh, I hope they did because they put on a hell of a show. Nia going out first made perfect sense. You mean, that's how you keep someone hot and still let other people get over because she didn't come out looking weak and they came out and they made it all look like that was really well booked. Poorly booked, second fall, Sasha Banks pinned out of nowhere. For everything that you've told us about Charlotte and Sasha, for all the story, all the mileage you've gotten out of that feud this year, why is she rolled? Like, why is that the elimination? Why is that the way it ends? I don't get it. I don't love the booking. Bailey winning with an elbow, which, by the way, if they want to replace the belly-to-belly suplex, which is that's what it is. If they want to replace it with the macho elbow, you've got the UD pod seal of approval. We're 100% here for it, and uh, really enjoy it. Next up was a ladder match, and in retrospect, we all might be stupid because there is a raw tag team title match, check, multiple teams, Check. And on Monday, it was moved to being a ladder match. Check. And we knew the Hardys were in Orlando. Check. Hmm. Why wouldn't they be there? And man, the way they pulled it off, and I know I, I, I don't know if I gave props earlier, if I should have, not many people are picked to host a WrestleMania. The New Day doing it is, one, a huge honor, and two, it allowed them to play with us in this moment. The three teams are in the ring. They're facing off. Bell's about to ring. The New Day's music hits. And and you heard some people in the crowd with the delete chants. I was on my couch like, they would. They couldn't. They wouldn't. They couldn't. They say, and they come out in their gear. Looks like they're going to compete. And Michael Cole, for all the ills of Michael Cole, a great call out of him. Go rewatch the moment. It's been one of the most watched things on YouTube since it happened. But it's Michael Cole saying, I think the New Day are going to compete. And the New Day saying, you know, there's room for one more team down there. You see him stretching. And that Hardy music hits. And you know the thing about it is I capped last week's episode that no one will ever hear. It ended with Hardy's music. And I'm so mad because I was right. I, was, I wasn't I was right because I never would have picked this. But when Matt and Jeff come out to that pop in Orlando where a certain owl is based, goosebumps. It reminds you for all the times you say, oh, part-timers and old guys and bring up new talent, there's something to be said for a familiar face. And... When Matt and Jeff hit that ramp, wow, that place erupted, and business, as a as a great man says, business picked up. Uh, the match started. It was just this is the Hardys match. This is what they do. This is their piece. That is the stones. This is their crowning achievement. They do ladders, so and they did them well. I love seeing them work with. Enzo and Cassidy, it was just great to see because, you know, Enzo's probably marking out the entire time and wanted to ask for an autograph because he's just one of us. But I'm glad he showed the restraint. I'm glad he didn't go out there and beg for beg for them to sign something. They looked great in there. They did a great job with Cesaro and Samus. I love the the spot where they're doing the – Cesaro's got him in the airplane spin and Seamus is doing the beats of the Bowery. And it's just the whole the, – the crowd – 
for all the things I didn't like about the Best of Seven series, this has been a great job in telling that story and finding us a way to care about this team. They've done a good job with that. Uh, I really... And then the ending. Carl Anderson eating the Twisted Fate off a ladder from Matt Hardy, who is 41. And Jeff Hardy jumping off of a 20-foot ladder through another ladder. Excuse me, through Cesaro, through another ladder, and kicking Chambers in the face and giving a black eye. Jeff Hardy's 39. So, um, I don't know how they do it. Jeff's never really gotten hurt doing this kind of crazy shit. He broke his leg in a motorcycle accident two years ago, or a year ago, which kind of kicked off the broken thing. But these guys are at the top of their game at their age, man. And they, you want to say they, they never won a ladder match. They never won a tag team title at WrestleMania. Jeff had never won at WrestleMania. And Matt's only win was over Jeff. I think he got one over Christian, too. But... This is a great way for them to come back. This is how you do a surprise. It was rumbled about. It was thought about. But no one knew for sure. And from the behind-the-scenes videos, it looks like the Hardys were in a trailer. Leading up to their debut, their re-debut, apparently they were in a hotel lobby eating lunch earlier that day, telling they are about to fly out, how beat up they were after the Ring of Honor show. And so, and remember, in the span of one month, the Hardys have held the TNA titles, the Honorable Ring titles, and now the WWE titles, in a first and probably last in this business, good for them. Record setters, legends. UNC wins the next wins the next day. I don't North Carolina stand up. Um, we're having Leonard Brothers on this weekend, so I'll have to deal with that there too. But yeah, welcome on Hardys. I just we're all dumb for not knowing it was coming. Uh, something I did call was Cena in the upper posing to Nikki. And the match happened. The match matters, I guess. I would have booked the squash like I proposed last week. That's either here nor there. And proposed on the radio show I was on. But, you know, great moment. It was the crossover moment in that you had Al Roker calling the, the intros and you got all the fans. Like, this is the match that Miz wanted when they were in Atlanta. This is the He had an eating out of the palm of his hand. And uh, good job by everyone involved. Of course, Nikki uh, got proposed to. She said yes. I think there, an underrated moment in this match is after Cena runs down, the low... The longest ramp of all time. He comes out, and you see him do his little intro, and then you see him visibly react and go out on the ring and go hug a woman. That's his mom. I guess she'd been in the hospital, didn't think she was going to come. They surprised him by putting her on the front row. It's a little, it's a little tiny, small moment that I thought was really well done. A big moment that I thought was really well done was Seth and Triple H. First of all, Triple H with the uh, Sons of Anarchy intro... And starring as Jim Teller, Stephanie McMahon, Helmsley. It's just... <laughs> I think that, honestly, Hunter was like, this is the longest ramp ever. There's no way in God's earth I'm walking it. Let's do a motorcycle entrance, guys. Like, that's... <laughs> that's how you wield the power of being the CEO. <laughs> and uh, Seth coming out as, like, I don't know what... He, the gold Power Ranger? It's fine. He looked great. Uh, lighting the... Turning the, um, the, the static in his... Minitron into, I guess it would be like gunpowder for a fire was kind of brilliant. He lit that torch that went down to the ring, and he went out there and slayed the king, like he said he would. Put on a great match. Uh, I wish they'd have kept him off TV the next Monday, if only because if he's going to sell the knee, let's sell the knee. But it's neither here nor there. I don't want to talk about Randy versus Bray. I was on the show last week defending that angle. I was on a radio show defending that angle. You guys won't ever hear that podcast, and uh, I'm not proud of saying I was wrong. I was wrong. I thought they, wow, they just missed the landing there. Uh, next up, Brock took on Goldberg in a perfect wrestling match, and people say, their match was shorter than the Undertaker's intro. It was. Um, <laughs> but that's not, we're not here for long matches. We're here for the right ones. I'm not here for a good time. I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time, and that's what they gave us. I loved Brock kicking out of the jackhammer. You kind of knew that spot had to happen. But they did a lot of stuff that I didn't think was going to happen that I think they could do. Goldberg took all those bumps on his neck. He put Brock through a, a, a barricade. Like, I didn't think anything was going to happen. But here we are. This is the reality. We've got Brock's back on top of the big belt. Four minutes, 11 seconds. Thank you, Goldberg. Hashtag. Naomi got the hometown pop we all expected. The one she deserved. Good for her winning that title there. And uh, good on the WWE for putting the belt on her. And then the last match. It was weird energy because even there, even on my couch, it was like, you've been in for a while, man. We should probably wrap this thing up. But if Taker wants to go out on his back with some time, 
And damn it, that's what Taker's going to do. And he's, he's earned it. So, uh, like I said, I grew up on Southern wrestling. I grew up on uh, realism and working the body part. But the way monsters work in this business is you're a monster. You're booked as a monster. You come and you kill everybody. Then you eventually get destroyed by a hero. That hero, for most of the 80s, was Hulk Hogan. After you've done that, you kind of flounder. You want to see a recent example? Look at Rusev's undefeated year. His first loss is to John Cena, and there you have it. It's tough in this business to go from a monster to an established character. I think Rusev is making the transition finally um, prior to his surgery. Taker did that 26 years ago. He took the gimmick of zombie mortician, Old West zombie mortician, mind you, and made it the most fearsome thing in the business. I hope the Wrestling Observer changes their title, the uh, the award from Best Gimmick to the Undertaker Award. And uh, the Dead Man's brought a lot of a lot of entertainment to us. Uh, Meltzer was on, or was, uh, Wade Keller, I think, was on. Uh, JR show and said that uh, and he had a, a meeting with a, a wrestler in 97 and said man Taker he's the best I never thought I'd see someone that good but I think he's got about two years left in him that was 20 years ago thank you for everything Taker uh, let's go back outside the ring before we head to the uh, the end of the show Kurt Angle as the straight man GM on, on Raw is going to be a revelation I loved making the role, but this is going to be something completely different and something I'm 100% here for. Uh, this is the, the moment. It happened. The Raw after Mania turned heel for me. Look, we're having a great night of wrestling. If you're wrestling fans, let's talk about the wrestling. Yeah, chant, cheer, put yourselves over. That's what you do. But when Mustafa Ali hits a springboard Spanish fly and you're concerned with a fucking beach ball, I'm allowed to go heel on you. I don't get it. I wish, I wish someone could explain it to me. I don't get it. Uh, Roman is over. And if you want to see what over means, he said six words in ten minutes, and the place was going, oh shit, that's over. It's not the over they want, but it's the over they got, and it's an over they can use. Uh, Hardy's, again, the schedule they're working, they're broken, and they're back. Uh, the Revival made their debut on Monday night. Welcome home. Uh, it's, what, it's where you deserve to be. It's the best tag team on the planet. They did the uh, the knee spot with uh, Kofi to get some immediate heat, and I think it's going to be a really good stay on the main roster for them. Charlotte and Nia, I like that little moment because I think you can turn Nia face pretty easily here because she was the one being disrespected. Uh, Emma's back. God bless you. Welcome home. Uh, and also back, the man who will hopefully reform the club soon, Finn Balor. And we'll talk about where that goes from there uh, as I get to the Superstar Shuffle rumors. But I thought it was interesting that they booked him to work with Seth Rollins, who kayfabe, and in reality, tore up, cost Finn six months. But uh, I got to ask now, now that it's live, is SmackDown Live after Mania a thing? Because that crowd was a crowd I could have rocked with. They had, they had their fun early, but they were here for the wrestling. They were here for, for the entering action. Unfortunately, SmackDown didn't bring the best things for it because... Look, we've proven the brain thing was wrong. I was wrong. Let's just drop it. Let's walk away. Let's wash our hands. Let's never discuss it again. Damn it. They're not going to. Free Luke Harper, please, because he's so good. And Rowan's back. Who called that? I mean, honestly, no, it's not coming. Ty Dillinger made his debut on SmackDown. And uh, if there's a better, if there's a better like plug-and-play mid-card uh, face, I don't know him in the business, man. He's going to be a great job there. And the moment of SmackDown, which I actually booked on this podcast that you'll never hear. I'm going to keep bragging. Eventually, I'm going to have... I saw Cold Fusion on that one show that no one ever listened to. <laughs> you had the Miz and Maurice come out doing their Cena thing. You knew the Cena and Nikki were taking time off. How do you deflect that? Oh, Nakamura. And this is where I think the, the problem with Reigns' booking is actually most apparent. We know we're supposed to hate the Miz. We know his shtick is mean and mean spirited and evil. He is a heel. That means when someone comes out to oppose him, whether we as whether a fan knows this person or not, whether he says a word or not, or whether we just get a mistimed intro because he's so excited to be there for the first time, 
Every fan in that building, every fan on USA knows that Shinsuke Nakamura is the face. You cheer for this man because, one, he's goddamn electric, and, two, he came out to shut up the Miz. The problem on Raw is that when your when you're heel heels off on Roman, we cheer. It's not so much Roman, it's a problem with Roman, it's the alignment of everyone around him. We need to make sure that we're telling a story that can be cohesive and understood. And last thing before we get out of here, there is a superstar shuffle coming up. So what that means is, I guess you're going to do kind of like a draft like you did before uh, SummerSlam last, uh, last year to do the original brand split. This time they're doing it after Mania. There's been one roster change that I didn't mention yet. Simon Gotch was released today by the WWE. Uh, there's an unverified insider on Reddit who's claiming that Simon just put too many people at risk when he wrestled. He wasn't very good in the ring. Aiden English will be getting a singles push with, if you remember from old NXT, his singing gimmick, which uh, was a great way to put over Cass. And I think it'd be uh, very interesting to see how they use it on the main roster. But let's talk about Superstar Shuffle Rumors. I'm sure there'll be some mid-card stuff, some undercard stuff. Let's start with the high. The New Day is coming to SmackDown. That's the rumor. That's the word on the street. It'll be a great shot in the arm for them. It'll give a shot in the arm to this beleaguered tag team division. And the um, Sue Russo's versus the New Day. Yeah, I'm kind of here for it. Uh, <laughs> next up, we think it looks like AJ's going to Raw. Uh, after his semi-face turn on Tuesday, I thought maybe, just maybe, they'd find a way to keep him. But it doesn't look hopeful at all from all reporting. AJ's going to Raw. Looks like Roman's going to stay on Raw. Which means I'd speculate Seth or... Finn would be headed to SmackDown. I think if you send Finn to SmackDown and send AJ to the uh, AJ to Raw, you could tell that story there, and then maybe you go with the club and turn them heel and have them be a big heel stable for Roman to face. But I'm sorry, we're going to cheer for the club uh, because of the TV Meltzer speculating that it could be a Bliss Charlotte swap. I'm only, I'm here for that because I think Charlotte Sting is Becky Lynch. And I think that's the natural pairing, and I think that it frees up Sasha to do the heel thing on Bailey. And apparently, the drifter is getting called up uh, in the next few weeks. He did work, and so is apparently AC and Almas, who did work the NXT tapings this past week, but will apparently be uh, making the move on up. I assume to the blue brand for both of them as well. That is it, guys. That is the end of Podomania recap season. Uh, I'm sorry that the original didn't get out to you guys, but again, I want to thank everyone who's helped out or listened over the road to WrestleMania. We've had a great time doing it. There will be less wrestling coverage for my non-wrestling fans. The, the Sunday shows are back. I'm um, taking one off, I think, the end of this month for my bachelor party. But beyond that, you're going to be back every week. We're going to be back to the summer. Uh, once baseball gets in swing, we'll have to see how we're going to negotiate that because I'll be damned if I talk about baseball every Sunday. That was your show. This is your outro.